Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. I'm your host, Dr. Alan. Delighted that you've joined us today. Are you a busy professional, passionate about the work of your calling, yet realize that even though you love what you are doing, you're exchanging your time for money? You know that if you were to lose the ability to exchange time for money, your financial well-being will be in jeopardy. If you can relate, I have great news. Steve Tucker Capital is an investment company designed for professionals to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Remove the anxiety of an uncertain financial future and go to steetalker.com. Get your free one-page 10-step guide to passive real estate investing. Hello, enlightened investors. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. We live in a world where extroversion is venerated and introversion is devalued. Yet it is the introverts in our world that bring us deep contemplation and meaningful insights to some of our most troubling questions. Our guest, Camilla Jeffs, brings us an introvert's path to real estate success. Camilla is a multifamily investor, mom of five, introverted investor, triathlete, reader, and a lifetime learner. Camilla, before we explore contemplative approaches to real estate investing, share a memorable experience from your formative years that helped you to be who you are today. Sure. Thanks so much for having me on, Alan. I'm really happy to be here. So when I was in high school, I was asked to be the team captain of my soccer team. And I was excited about that opportunity, but also very nervous about the opportunity because it was a big thing to be the captain and to kind of shoulder the responsibility of leading a team. And during that time, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot that about myself, how being like an introvert can still lead teams because I wasn't, you know, in high school, I, I had several friends, but I didn't have an enormous group of friends. I didn't feel comfortable having a lot of friends. I had just just, you know, a couple of really good ones, right? And that's what we do as introverts. We have deep relationships, not, not lots of shallow relationships. But leading a team is a little bit different because you have to be involved more with everybody. You and you have to be, you, you do have to have conversations with every single person on the team. And so one of the things I did is I actually started writing back and forth to my teammates. And so I would write in a little journal and and then let them write back to me. And it was a it was a really interesting, unique and comfortable way to communicate with others when when sometimes verbal communication feels a little bit too intense. Written communication can help to relay your messages better. So it's an experience that I had. Yeah, that is interesting. You know, introverts actually do make some of the best leaders, but we don't teach our introverts that they actually can be effective leaders. Well, I'm glad you found that out at an early age. Well, let's go into real estate, Camilla, and tell us how you have quietly built your portfolio and tell us about that journey. So in the beginning, my husband and I were living in a garage apartment and it wasn't a very nice garage apartment. And we were both contemplating, you know, we were young, married and had no money and both in college working on our bachelor's degrees. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how do we even buy a house? We were in that stage. We're like thinking, and, and I was pregnant with my first child as well. And we're trying to think, figure out how to buy a house. Well, we had um, our landlady at the time, she owned several rentals and we started talking to her one day and said, how did you do this? How did you get a whole bunch of rentals? And she said, well, you know, one thing that you guys could do is you could buy a house and then that has a basement apartment in it and you could rent that out. And we thought, well, that's kind of a brilliant idea. We'd never thought about that before. And so that's exactly what we did. We purchased a home, we moved into it so we could get the best financing. And then we rented out the basement. It had three bedrooms in the basement in a kitchen and we rented all those out and we were able to live in that property for less than a hundred dollars a month is what we paid. And also it had a pool. So how cool was that? So we got to live in a house with a pool for a hundred dollars a month. And that's when I started thinking, okay, there's something to this real estate thing. Um, and so the, as I was contemplating, 
and learning. So I started reading a lot of books and learning and trying to navigate how to be successful in real estate. Well, of course, there's this whole lane of real estate that's you know creative financing, that's you know door knocking, that's cold calling, you know, to find the best deals. And that kind of stuff, you know, as an introvert made me crazy. You know, gave me so much anxiety. I didn't, I couldn't do it. And so I was thinking, well, how can I still be successful in real estate? How can I still do this? And so the strategy that we landed on was doing the live in flip method, which is where you buy a broken down home and you go in, you live there, right? So you get the best financing and low down payment to get into it. And then you fix it up while you're living there. So is it a comfortable you know, thing to do? No, right? It's very messy and, and uncomfortable to live in a construction zone, but it was a very good strategy for us. And we did that for many different homes and we'd move in, we'd live there for about two years, we'd move out and we either rent it or sell the property. And as we were doing that and acquiring homes, we thought, okay, next step, let's see if we can get a small multi-unit. So, we'll get, um, so we purchased a fourplex. And again, we were doing everything ourselves. So all the management, all the maintenance, all the, it was all, you know, our own money, our own time, our own effort, our own muscles. And we started building like that. But when you build like that, you get to a point where you run out of money, you run out of time. And you get really tired from all that work and effort that you're doing. Plus, by that time, we had five children. And so I am thinking, well, what do we do now? Because we were getting tired and we're trying to figure out what the next step was. And so I always had on my vision board to buy an apartment complex. And with an apartment complex, they cost millions of dollars. And in our bank account was not millions of dollars. And so we're trying to figure out, well, how do you even purchase an apartment complex? And that's when we realized it's a partnership. You 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 need to have partners in order to purchase something like that. And that made me feel even more anxious because I never done that before. And I remember in you know high school and college with the group projects and I did all the work and there's lots of free floaters right <laughs> on the teams because I was intent on getting the grade that was important to me. Um, and so I'm thinking, well, if I can't trust people to do like a college research paper, how can I trust them to run a multi-million dollar acquisition with me? So it took a lot of work on my part to really come to a place where I could feel comfortable investing with others. And so the first thing we did was invested passively as a passive investor into a syndication, which is just a fancy word for group investment. And then from there, I loved it so much. It was such an incredible experience that I was like, wow, I need to teach more people about this. This is pretty amazing. And I need to help others to also invest into these apartment complex as a group and nav- help them navigate how to find the right groups and how to build the trust and what you need to understand the knowledge to be able to invest. And so that's why I launched Steady Stream Investments. And that's what I do today is I teach others how to invest passively into group investments. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As an industry-leading, relationship-focused, design-build construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145 or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. Well, that is definitely quite an incredible journey. I've been there and done that uh, as well in terms of buying a home and living in it while renovating. Not only was I living in it and renovating, I was doing most of the work to do that. And as you say, that can get very tiring very, very quickly was a tremendous learning experience. I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to learn what you need to learn to be an investor, but I learned a lot and I was very tired. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. Me too. (laughs) You mentioned that you started out in real estate syndication as a passive investor. Mm -hmm. 
What exactly is the difference between a passive and active investor? And why did you start out as passive? Yeah, so a passive versus active investor. So the active investor are the ones who are actively out there finding the deal. So they're the ones calling brokers, they're calling owners, doing a lot of cold calling, they're meeting, they're flying to the areas, they're checking out the areas, they're walking the properties. And so they're they're finding the property. Then once they find it, get it under contract, they're working with the lenders to get the financing, they're working with all the inspections and doing their due diligence and they close the property and then they're managing it and they're making sure property management is good because we always hire professional property management. So there's a lot of work that goes into a large multifamily acquisition. A passive investor, on the other hand, is a pretty sweet deal. So a passive investor, they are simply the ones that, that help to fund the transaction. So like the down payment, for example. So they get to invest their money into a multifamily multifamily apartment complex and they don't have to do any of the work. That's simply what they do. So you have to vet the opportunity in front of you in the beginning, right? So make sure that you understand who the sponsors are and make sure you look at the deal and you feel comfortable with the numbers on the opportunity. And then as soon as you feel comfortable with that, then you sign the documents, you wire money, and now you're along for the ride. And then after you invest, you can expect to receive updates. So sometimes they're monthly, sometimes they're quarterly updates and distribution. So you'll be getting cash flow, which is pretty awesome that you can live off of. That's just money coming in. It's like another paycheck. So another stream of income. And then also you'll get really great tax benefits. So you'll every year you'll get a K-1 from the team that shows any tax losses that you had on that real estate, which can then translate into your own. You'll check with your CPA, of course, to for your own situation. And then you also get to participate in the appreciation. So you know we all know real estate appreciates over time. And so however long they hold that property, it'll appreciate. And then when they sell it, you will get to share in the profits. So passive investing is pretty darn awesome. Well, have you done both passive and active in terms of syndication? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like I said, I started out passive. I loved it so much that I went into active. And so now I'm an active general partners on deals. And I still look at passive opportunities as well. Well, what are the top three active investments for introverts? So the top three, I would say, of course, passive investing is my number one. The second one is uh, short-term rentals. So I really like short-term rentals because they can be very hands-off, right? So you can hire a property management company. You don't have to manage it yourself if you don't want to. I suppose if you want to, you can. And there's systems and tools to help with that. But you can like figure out all the data, figure out all the information, and then be able to purchase the property and just have someone manage it. And the third is is note investing. And now note investing is you basically buy someone's mortgage. So someone who's having trouble is in trouble with the bank paying the mortgage. The bank is going to foreclose on them. You can go in and you can buy notes from them. And that's another great way to invest as an introvert. So why do you like the short-term rentals? Uh, I like short-term rentals because they have really great cash flow. I also like it because it's a destination. So you know, it's for our family that we can take our family and we can go stay in our property and enjoy it you know, just as much as the guests who enjoy it. And so those are you know, some of the reasons that I like short-term rentals. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Are those generally single-family home, or do you have multifamily short-term rentals or a combination of both? Generally single-family is what I do. And so you are choosing those in locations where you like to go visit. Is that your criteria primarily? (laughs) 
that. So that's one of the factors that goes into it. So a place we like to visit, yes. But you take into account, there's lots of different factors that you'd need to dig into when selecting a location for a short-term rental. I um, mean, some of those is seasonality is, you know, is the place, is it in a place where people only come in the summer or is it a place where people only come in the winter, you know, like ski towns. And, and if it is, it's, you can still be profitable. You just have to figure out how much you need to charge during those you know, peak seasons in order for to pay the mortgage and, and, and have money. But yeah, there's lots of different factors. So occupancy, how often is it going to be occupied? How much can you charge in, in rent? And then also you have to be very careful about whether it's allowed or not. So a lot of cities are you know kind of trying to crack down on short-term rentals in cities. So I kind of avoid cities and I look for vacation destination places where short-term rentals are abundant. You mentioned that some are summer places, some are winter places. What's the average occupancy rate over a year in most short-term rentals? Well, so that's hard to say, but you want to look for something that's at least 50%. So you would not want to go for a place that had less than 50% occupancy so that you can turn a nice profit. For me, I look for 70 to 80% occupancy. But you could still cash flow with 50% occupancy? Mm -hmm. uh Yeah. So that's probably your risk variable there is 50%, but you shoot for 75, 80% is... Correct. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Well, where do you have your rentals? So short-term rental is in a town in Oklahoma that's by a lake. So I like to look for lakes. And why Oklahoma? Because it's about two hours from my house. So it's one that we can definitely use with the family. With frequency. As long as it's not occupied, because it's occupied a lot. (laughs) (laughs) So you have to plan your vacations around tenant occupancy, Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. (laughs) Well, interesting there. Well, what are your favorite active investments? Favorite active investments? Well, I like multifamily, right? So I'd like to be an active investor in multifamily. And then for active, I like the live and flip method a lot. And that's one, that's a strategy that I used a a lot to be able to acquire single family homes as, as we're growing up. Well, what do you do when you can no longer scale on your own? And how can an introvert build a team? You said that was your biggest challenge. And you went back to your high school years and looked at how you built a team there. But there's a big difference between building a soccer team and building a syndication team. So what are the techniques you're employing? Yes. So there's definitely a big difference. And when I started out, like I said, all of the investing we'd done up until that point had been on our own. I'd never gone to a real estate meetup. I'd never gone to a a networking session or conference or anything like that. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And I found one. So we were living in Arizona at the time and I found a meetup that was for women in real estate. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I've never heard of another woman doing real estate (laughs) because my network was very small, right? My friends were weren't doing it. Uh, you know, people I knew were not in real estate. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll go and I'll see what I can figure out. And I went in there and I immediately felt at home because there were, you know, 20 women sitting around the table who were all talking about the things I like to talk about, right? They're talking about taxes. They're talking about renovations and they're talking about how to acquire more properties and how to find them. And, and it was amazing. It was really amazing to me to find kind of a community of investors who were like me. Um, And so after that experience, I said, okay, you know, if I want to get into multifamily and and start breaking into this, I need to really start networking because I got to find a partner. And I was, you know, agonizing over this. I need a partner. I need a partner. And how am I going to find a partner? And especially when I like, I went to a real estate conference in January of 2020. It was a multifamily one and there were about a thousand people there. (laughs) And, And I distinctly remember walking in and it took every ounce of courage I had to not turn around and just walk right back out because it was it was overwhelming for me the the noise in the room was was a lot you know the just the humming that you know so many people talking to each other and the little groups that had formed and and it's very terrifying to like try and insert yourself into one of those groups you know I'd like kind of walk over and hover awkwardly <laughs> I don't know because I don't interrupt. I hate interrupting people because I don't like to be interrupted. And and then also 
you know, if people ask me a question, I need a time to think about my answer before, you know, formulate a good thought before it comes out of my mouth. And I think that's a, you know, a characteristic that introverts have. Um, and so at that conference, this, here's a couple strategies that I, that I use. So number one, I walked in that room and I knew that I couldn't handle the groups, right? I couldn't handle going around to the groups. So instead I looked at the tables and I scanned the tables and I looked for somebody else who was sitting alone by themselves. And and I thought, you know what? That person is probably another introvert like me. <laughs> I'm going to go sit by that person and I'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's exactly what I did at this conference. So that was one of the strategies that I used. The second strategy I used was I set a goal and I said, okay, Camilla, you got to talk to three people, right? You talk to three people. As soon as you do those three people, you have permission to exit, right? If you're not feeling it anymore and you, and you, need to, you still need to leave, then you can leave, but you have to get three people in. And so those are two strategies that I like to use whenever I go to conferences to talk to people because you have to talk to people to get a partner. And it's not always that they're going to come to you and say, hey, will you be my partner? Especially when you're new in multifamily. Those were very important and interesting enough. Like the person I sat by that very first multifamily conference is one of my partners today, right? And as we developed a very deep relationship and she's fantastic. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Would you ever invest all your money in a single stock? Very unlikely. Yet investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Investor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. Investors can build their own custom portfolio selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single family homes, multifamily, student housing, self storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestra also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestra's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestrainc.com. Avestra, real estate investing made simple. Well, that sounds like a really horrible, awful experience. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally relate to that. You know, I wonder if introverts even really think about, I knew exactly what you meant when you said all of that humming. I knew exactly what you meant and exactly what you felt. I don't know if extroverts ever feel that or ever notice it because they seem to enjoy loud rooms, which mm -hmm. for me, they are always overwhelming and that feeling of I walking in that door and the only thing you want to do is turn around and run. I, I know that feeling backwards and forwards. How many times that's happened to me in my life? Well, those are good goals. Find somebody who is sitting there alone. Like you said, they're probably an introvert and chances are they're feeling just as awkward as you feel and would love to have somebody come and talk to them. And then three people. And then I like the fact that you said after three people, you gave yourself permission to leave if it just wasn't clicking. We need to take care of ourselves. A lot of times we forget to do that. Well, Camilla, how can folks get in touch with you? You've got so much to share. So tell us what you can share with us and how we can get in touch with that. Yeah, so I'd love to get in contact. So you can follow me on social. I'm the introverted investor on Instagram. And also you can find me on my website, CamillaJeffs.com. And there on my website, I do have a free guide for introverts on how to have success in real estate, where I dive pretty deep into a couple of strategies and things that you can do do to really be successful. And her website is Camilla or her email is Camilla at SteadyStreamsInvestments.com. Her website is SteadyStreamsInvestments.com. And her guide is on that page. Well, Camilla, share with us one of your most difficult setbacks. How did you come through that time? And what did you learn from the experience? Um, so one of our most difficult setbacks was a flip that we were working on. And it was a home that we bought. And one of the reasons that we bought it was because it was super cheap. We bought it for $30,000. And we thought we'd be able to, you know, put, you know, five to 10, around $10,000 into it to fix it up. And then we could sell it, right? And we could sell it for 55 to 60,000 was kind of the goal. Well, we started, you know, renovating the property and my twin daughters were 
six months old at the time. So we'd bring them with us to the property and we do all the renovations and, and work on that. But what ended up happening is because it was in a not so great area, and that's one of the lessons that we learned about Brian properties, right? Location super important. It got broken into multiple, multiple times. So the first time someone stole all the copper piping from the basement because it was an open basement and the, the pipes were exposed. So they stole all the copper piping. <laughs> like, what? So we had to get new copper pipe in. We put new copper pipe in. Well, that was a mistake because now there's new copper pipe for someone else to steal or maybe the same person, but it got broken into stolen again. So second time. So two times they came and they stole the copper pipe. So we learned from that to put in PEX instead of copper because copper at the time was going for a premium. And so, you know, drug dealers could, if they could get that, they could get money, get their drugs. So that was really frustrating. And then just, you know, probably problem after problem after problem happened with that home. We couldn't sell it. We, we tried to just put it on the market and sell it. Nobody wanted to buy it. Um, even if we lowered the price and lowered the price and lowered the price, still nobody wanted to buy it. And so we're like, okay, now what do we do? So instead we put tenants in there. And so we get some tenants, but of course it's in an area where the, the rent is really low and, and the, you know, the, the type of tenants that you get in there aren't necessarily quality tenants. So we had trouble with tenants and we had to like kick out a couple and then another other, and then finally, the last tenant that we had in there started a fire in the kitchen and burned like half the property. <laughs> and so we were just like constantly like banging our heads about this this property and trying to figure out what what to do with it. But I think the the good thing about it was that we learned several um, important lessons. It you know as going through that experience as awful as it as it was, and most important was you know buy in the right area, right? Don't go after property just because it's cheap. Make sure that you do your homework about the location. Yes, you can buy cheap properties and do well with them, but you need to make sure that you can find the property that's going to do well for you because this one did not do well and it was all because of location. How did you finally get rid of that place? Uh, we finally sold it several years later. We had to hang on to it for several years until it got to a point where we could we could sell it. Well, hard lessons, I guess, sometimes can be very, very good lessons to learn. Yes. <laughs> Not fun lessons, but they can certainly be good lessons. Well, Camilla, when you come to the end of life's journey, as you look back on your life, what do you look back on with your greatest sense of joy and fulfillment? Well, for sure, that would be my relationship with my family, my children and my husband. And I want them to remember me as a, you know, as someone who was there for them always and who was a good listener and who was interested in them and, and they could talk to you about anything. I think that would be kind of the, the ultimate for me. Well, Camilla, it was definitely a joy having you. Thank you for sharing your successes and for sharing your ups and downs in life. Pleasure having you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Alan. I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at Steve talker.com.